This evening, we're, we're going to have a very interesting speaker talking to you about very interesting things, uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Eric Kamek. And uh, rather than read through a very extensive uh, CV about him, he and I just discussed how I'm simply going to say that he's the director of the Gene Editing Institute here at Christiana Care. He's affiliated faculty College of Health Sciences at the University of Delaware, a professor and chairman of chemistry department at Delaware State University in the past, and also in the past co-founder and chief scientific officer and board member of, of Orpha Genics. He went to, he went to, he did go to the Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, for an MS in Cell Biology, Rutgers University for a BA in Biology, and where did you do your PhD? In Florida. All right, so anyway, my friend, Eric. That wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, so, and I thought that was supposed to be short, so I begged him to do that. Anyway, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, give you two short talks tonight, <clears throat> and then hopefully we can engage in a good conversation uh, about CRISPR and gene editing. Um, we have been uh, at this for a long time, and our lab has contributed to some of the CRISPR uh, work directly and indirectly, and we are certainly uh, heavily involved in that here uh, at Christiana. So uh, the first talk I'm going to give you is really going to be kind of how this all began and how we got here um, and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work that had gone on to make us think about our ability to actually edit genes. And then um, in the second part, I'm going to uh, talk about some specific things we're doing on the campus here. And they go all the way from um, developing new tools for research, uh, working on a cancer diagnostic, which has been uh, launched, and then tell you about a really uh, complicated and difficult trial for lung cancer that we're, uh, we're working on. Um, and then uh, at the end, tell you a little bit about where we stand with the ethics of gene editing. Um, I've been back and forth to Boston the last couple of weeks, and um, we have obviously some very interesting problems since the Chinese um, apparently have gone ahead and edited a child, and uh, now uh, the twins are supposedly uh, prospering, although I heard a rumor in Boston that it's all fake. So we'll see where we all come out <laughs> on it. So all kinds of wild things. Um, so uh, I'm sure Netflix will have a movie or two on there. Uh, there was a rumor a couple years ago that Jennifer Lopez was going to star in a, uh, I think it was for NBC, a series called CRISPR. And uh, that never came about. We were all were hoping to be in that, believe me. But uh, so far, the phone has not rung. So. So I'm going to start, um, see, oh great, is this, can you see the great? So this is a, a very famous picture. This is how gene therapy began. Uh, these are a group of uh, people who are at the National Institutes of Health uh, in the mid-70s, early 80s. And um, the objective here was to treat an immunodeficiency disease known as ADA. And uh, the people who are in this picture uh, including uh, Ken Culver, Mike Blaze, and French Anderson, are considered to be kind of the founders of genetic medicine. Uh, NIH started working in this area quite some time ago, and their primary goal was to augment the gene deficiency. So in fact, if you had an inherited disease, it was usually because you had a gene or two that were not functioning properly. And that's actually the, still the same story. There are a lot of diseases that we face that have a dysfunctional gene. And there's many reasons why it's dysfunctional. And <clears throat> unlike today, um, although I can tell you with dealing with the FDA, it's not far different with gene editing than this, um, this was a patient trial of an N of 1. This young woman, Ashanti De Silva, was actually the only patient ever injected with this. I think this is her mother here. And uh, it kind of worked. Uh, so she got better for about three months, and people hailed this as a real successful uh, uh, demonstration. 
But what had happened to this child um, is actually a big problem that we still worry about. Uh, because genes are basically biological material, even though they're chemicals, uh, there's a chance that they have, you can have an immune response to the treatment, and she did. And so uh, after about three months, she developed an immune response and they ceased the treatment. Now, um, so this is not a morbid story, there is actually a number and was actually a number of different um, treatments for her. So she didn't die, she just didn't get a lot better, but at least there was a boost in that enzyme. And, uh, and these guys were, were pretty happy. I actually ended up training with Mike Blaze, myself, uh, for a few years, and he's a great guy. He was really a very, very forward-thinking guy. He's a pediatrician at NIH and ended up the head of gene therapy. So uh, really, really good guy. They were all very, very concerned uh, about this child. And then in 1999, uh, the world kind of woke up a little bit about the power of genes. Uh, well, we had known a lot about genes and we understood how they functioned. Uh, suddenly, the human genome was sequenced. So we knew every base. Um, we can probably put it all together now. We, we know most of the DNA sequence of humans and most other uh, animals. The pig, who looks pretty happy in that picture, uh, is actually one of the um, earliest uh, mammalian type eukaryotic uh, animals that was, were actually sequenced. And there's a reason for that we can talk about later. Uh, pigs are very important medically, and especially with CRISPR, they're, they're going to play a major role. That may not be a uh, comforting thought to you, <laughs> but uh, pigs are gonna enter into your lives at some point. Um, so here's just some, some basics, and, and I pilfered this slide from a colleague of mine um, because I actually didn't have it, which sounds kind of dumb. But uh, there are about 3 billion base pairs of your DNA. Uh, the average chromosome is 120 million base pairs. The average gene is 2,000 to 200,000 base pairs. Dystrophin, for example, is very large. Uh, CTFR is very large. Um, other genes like insulin are tiny, 3,000 bases or so. And within all of that, at 3 billion base pairs, if you have a single base wrong in the wrong spot, you get a genetic disease. So it's, it's an astonishing uh, thing. Now, where do these arise from? So most human genetic diseases aro arose through evolution under what we call selective pressure. So sickle cell disease, for example, emerged out of the Congo with people who had been infected with malaria and survived because malaria requires the incorporation of parasites into uh, blood cells, and those who had sickle cell actually weren't infected. So the rest of the folks passed away, and sickle cell proliferated, and it started to grow. Uh, the same thing is true for cystic fibrosis and dysentery in India. So uh, these, these mutations actually arise somewhat spontaneously. I mean, there's lots of ways to argue that. But in fact, most of them are caused by a single base pair. So how do you think about this? Think about each base being a letter in the spelling of a word. And if you have a book, and I'll show you an example, I think, in the next, um, next couple of slides about how hard this is. Um, if you have a single misspelled word in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which maybe some of you probably remember, I say that, and uh, I'm thinking, geez, my kids don't even, I don't know the last time they ever mailed a letter, actually. So, um, so and you have one base pair wrong in there. That's about what we're talking about here. And so how do you find it and how do you deal with it? So why didn't Mike Blaze and Culver and French Anderson's uh, gene therapy work? Well, we just, if you have a bad gene, we give you a good gene, okay? And the reason for that was it was really hard to deliver that good gene into your body by injection or by uh, some sort of inhalation. Um, the physics of diffusion is that it's hard to get even viruses to penetrate a lot of cells, especially in a tissue. Tissues are not just one cell layer, they're packed. And so that challenge still faces us today, and it's one of the biggest challenges that we face in lung cancer over in the cancer center. Uh, important genes are pretty tough to get squinched into a virus that can be then infected into the person and, and delivered. Um, a lot of times, viruses like to integrate where we don't want them to. There are a couple of very famous French gene therapy trials where these uh, male 
uh, babies were had also an immunodeficiency disease, and they were uh, placed into a trial where they used a virus to integrate a good copy of the gene, and everything went really well. I was actually at the meeting in Colorado years ago when the French group presented this, and then suddenly three of the children died. And the reason was is because the virus infected into a tumor suppressor gene, caused the tumor suppressor gene not to suppress anymore, but to activate a tumor, and the kids died of leukemia. So the danger of where these things go inside your body uh, is still challenging, and that has not been solved as of yet. And then there's the problem of unregulated gene expression. Now, uh, we know in children and in uh, and teenagers, unregulated movement and activity is pretty common. <laughs> that has nothing to do with unregulated gene expression. But in fact, um, genes are expressed at a certain time in your body. The biggest one is, is hemoglobin. Before you were born, you're primarily getting your blood delivered by uh, something called fetal globin, which is an alpha globin type of molecule. When you're born, that gets turned off and you get beta globin from a different gene, a whole different set of things. So when you start to muck around with this stuff back and forth and you tip the balance and change things, it makes a big difference and the body does not respond well. So these are the real challenges and I mentioned the immune system that had happened with um, uh, Ashanti uh, still plagues some of the work that was here. The most famous uh, problem of this actually was at the University of Pennsylvania in 1999 when a, uh, a young man named Jesse Gelsinger, and this is kind of the you know, the major case that's cited all the time, was uh, treated with a gene therapy vector and he died because his immune response was so great they couldn't get, couldn't get um, the corrective measures to him in time. So um, in 1999, there were a whole series of papers published in the Journal of Clinical uh, Investigation. And to tell you how old I am, there I am here. And at the time, uh, this was the entire field. <laughs> Uh, most of us were uh, in the witness protection program, as they say. We, we were very few of us actually believing this would ever work, and uh, I'm still not sure it's going to work, but I think we're closer. So uh, we've been at this a long time, and even though it doesn't seem like that, um, uh, we, there's actually a lot of good science that's gone on for, for a number of years. So uh, currently at Christiana, we have excellent doctors doing this, um, and here we are at the Cancer Center. <laughs> trying to fix a chromosome. So uh, when this transition will take place, uh, we're not really sure. There are clinical trials in humans with CRISPR today, and uh, there are three patients cured of sickle cell disease uh, as of this afternoon. So it works. It's just a question of what else is it doing, and, and we'll talk more about that. So uh, this is where we are now with excellent care and service, and patients get a lot better here, but eventually, probably in your lifetime and certainly in children's lifetime, the majority of diseases will be treated with genetic tools uh, because then it's, a one, it's one or two times. It's not a constant thing. The, you've seen this already with CAR T cells. If you, any of you have unfortunately had experience with cancer and you're treated with T cell immunotherapy, CAR T cell therapy is one time. And so far all the patients that have been treated with CAR T are completely cancer free. So, uh, is it miraculous? Yes, and that makes us all very nervous because we don't know what else has happened there, to be perfectly honest. And then as we began to advance along, and this is kind of getting into the, um, uh, the time in which a lot of us are, are dealing with things, um, a lot of the popular press began to um, pick up on the process of CRISPR. And uh, I'm going to tell you in a while what CRISPR stands for, but you won't like it. It's complicated, and it's very good that it has an excellent acronym. Uh, it does sound like a part of your refrigerator where your lettuce is kept, uh, or a breakfast cereal. So um, either one of those is, uh, is worth it, but CRISPR is a great acronym. And uh, it's, it actually is, uh, represents a series of repeated DNA sequences that some people who are interested in milk fermentation noticed. And, um, they decided that that was pretty interesting, but it took two women scientists, Jennifer Doudna from University of California, Berkeley, and Emmanuel Chapantier, who is now at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, to democratize it and transfer it into human cells. So CRISPR has been around since the beginning of time because it's how bacteria work, and we'll talk about that a little later. 
uh, in defending themselves against their own viral infections. Uh, it just happens to work really well in humans. And those two women and Fen Zhan from MIT are likely Nobel laureates in the next three to five years should this continue, uh, unquestionably. Uh, we're moving along, and Ge National Geographic has now begun to pick up on this. Um, and the DNA revolution really involves CRISPR. Uh, that's kind of what they're talking about. DNA sequencing is great. Almost all of you who go get a blood test have a panel of genes looked at, have DNA sequence made. Uh, that's pretty commonplace, but that's a technology that is just telling you something about the sequencing. Uh, it's really gene editing uh, that's going to transform people's lives in a lot of ways, and not always in the, in the best ways. And again, that, that gets to the ethics and the use of this uh, in society, and, and we as a group take that very seriously. So essentially, uh, we are now on the new frontier. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, Christiana Care is uh, swinging behind us very nicely in this. But I think it's because we are rational and logical and very uh, careful and cautious about using this and, and reducing this to practice. So um, eventually, as I said, gene editing is going to become a commonplace tool. It already is in genetics. There are very few uh, model animals, whether they're mice, monkeys, rats, um, bacterial cells that are not created with CRISPR now. Everybody switched to it because it's pretty straightforward to do. So these are some very cool names and I'm really happy to be in a field that works on meganucleases. That sounds like something that The Rock would star in. In fact, he did star in a movie called Rampage um, that was about CRISPR. I don't know how many people saw Rampage with The Rock. This CRISPR falls out of the sky from a satellite and hits two animals and a wolf has wings and grows and this gorilla gets gigantic. So if you go outside and you see one of those things walking around, you know where it came from. Um, so meganuclease, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR. It's a very warlike field. We're, we're, <laughs> we're always fighting. Um, these are the four tools that people use and they do one thing. They cut DNA very specifically. So keep in mind what I told you, that your DNA is a series of letters or bases, pretty unique. Uh, women have a more fine-tuned uh, genome. Uh, men are different. My wife reminds me that is no surprise. Uh, and men have a odd chromosome, the Y chromosome. There's not much on there, and my wife says there's a reason for that. <laughs> so all of this is making sense as I grow older with her. Um, but in general, the sequence of you is fairly unique. But there are regions that are kind of common among all of us. And so we can design each of these tools. These are naturally occurring and partially synthetic tools that we design in the lab routinely to cut DNA at a very specific spot. So the world started with meganucleases. Um, they're huge. They're ugly, uh, difficult to make. We moved to zinc finger nucleases, which are a little smaller then to talons, which grab the DNA, like talons, literally, and then CRISPR-Cas9. And I'm going to go through these in the second talk in more detail and why, why they're slightly different. But I did want to just present the tools that are currently available to geneticists. And they, here's a double, double helix of DNA, and here's kind of the structures that these tools get on the DNA. The CRISPR-Cas9 complex is absolutely the coolest, and that's because it's the simplest. So. These tools are, are working great. So even with these new tools, uh, we still face the problem of delivery. So people in this field have chosen to uh, approach some of the early trials in what we call the ex vivo approach, which means that we take your stem cells out of your bone marrow, we treat them with a genetic tool to fix a disease or to knock out a gene that's causing you trouble, and then we put them back in. In that way, it's more like a a bone marrow transplantation or bone marrow effect. Now, I can tell you from experience, it ain't that easy. <laughs> uh, it turns out that the progenitor cells and stem cells in your bone marrow don't like to come out of where they are. They're pretty comfortable in there. It's warm, lots of fluid, lots of, you know, it's like watching TV. It's just, it's lovely in there. And here we rip them out, we put them out in a dish, and uh, we muck them up with a crisper or something, and then we ask them to go back in there. It's still a big problem. Uh, it's, it's really, really challenging. And then, of course, trying to deliver this to a specific site inside an organ that's suffering from cancer, lung, liver, pancreas, 
how do you get it only to that uh, organ and how do you get only to the tumor cells of that organ because not the entire organ is not, is not in, uh, encased in cancer. So those are the problems that we face. And um, you might have imagined that from 1999 when I kind of entered this field that um, somebody might have figured this out, <laughs> but uh, they have not. And it tells you the magnitude of the problem because the quality of people who worked on delivering biomolecules to cells has is, is been pretty good. Very, very bright folks. So I want to talk just for a couple minutes about what they actually look like. So this circular uh, diagram here really talks about how people package CRISPR-Cas9 into a ball and then deliver it. And we can use viral vectors. So these are a bunch of viruses that you get and probably have in your body right now. Um, and so adeno-associated virus, what's known as a lentivirus, which is a complex set of viruses, and adenovirus. Um, they're, Viruses are very, very evolved, and they actually have incredibly beautiful geometry. But they're also extremely efficient of infecting you. Anyone who's just lived through a cold, you probably have part of that caused by rhinovirus and adenovirus. Adeno-associated virus usually comes along for the ride. So these two guys are in your body all the time. They don't usually by themselves cause any problems. And so they're often used to deliver CRISPR-Cas9. So what happens is the DNA of this virus is extracted. The genes for CRISPR and Cas9 are put in there. It's sealed back up, and away it goes. And it goes very efficiently into your cells. Does it discriminate between cancer and normal cells? Not yet, but that's a big area of work. So these other things here, which are horrible-looking things, uh, lipids, polymers, uh, calcium phosphate, um, all these kind of things, I like the DNA nano clue, it's, it's sometimes called DNA nano claw. Uh, these little ball looking structures, these guys actually are used almost exclusively in what I just told you when people take cells out of the body because these things don't require any sort of penetration. You can just add them and mix them with the cells and they tend to merge into the cells. So that's called physical or chemical delivery and this is called viral delivery. Um, I put this slide in here. I have a colleague of mine at the University of Minnesota, Cliff Steer, who has worked on this for a long time, and I think he's more depressed than ever. <laughs> he has not been able to really break this code of how to get this to work really efficiently. It might be the long winters up in uh, Minnesota, too, that he's depressed. Okay, so um, beyond the fact that people are now sort of oscillating a little bit toward using viruses to deliver CRISPR and genetic engineering tools. I wanted to point out a couple of, um, couple of problems. You can ignore the size and the genome size. That's not that important for tonight. But people are thinking about uh, effectively using adeno-associated virus to deliver to the eye, liver, muscle, and central nervous system. Adenovirus is mostly for tumors and the ex vivo approach. And lentiviruses uh, are very hot right now in T-cell immunotherapy. So if you've heard about T-cell therapy, uh, and we actually have a project in that too uh, with Penn, uh, actually that one seems to do well when it's infected with lentivirus. Immunogenicity is an extremely important part of this. Um, Adeno-associated virus was thought to be completely immuno genetic deficiency. It didn't cause an immune response, but now it kind of does. Uh, adenovirus was always known to be very immunogenic, and lentivirus is extremely low. So you have a whole series of these problems that keep arising, uh, making it where they're going to go in the body, immunogenicity, but they're the best we have right now. And so people are trying to do this, improve this all the time, but so far it's been, it's been a real challenge. Uh, this is a kind of a picture of what's known as a lipid nanoparticle. This is a hot item right now for a lot of folks. Uh, pretty ugly. Uh, I'm not sure I want that stuck in me somewhere. Um, but if you use your imagination a little bit, it kind of looks like a virus, actually. And so we're trying to do build things. So there's just lipids, like fat droplets. Nanoparticles are tiny little solid beads that DNA likes to wrap around, and it, it's attracted like static electricity, it sticks on there. And then they're engineered with uh, lipids and amino acids and cholesterol and nucleic acid, and they're all kind of packaged in a very, very sophisticated multi-layer complex, and they're delivered into carry CRISPR. So anything that's very complex is, the readout's pretty complex, and so it's kind of hard to, to understand how these are going to work. 
But a lot of work is being done here at University of Delaware on these type of projects. They have an incredibly good engineering department. Uh, we kind of feel the virus is the best way to go because of our work in, in vivo uh, rather than, than in vitro way. Okay, so uh, this is a, um, it, it looks complex, but, it, but believe me, it's not. So here I've just illustrated three different genetic engineering tools, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR. Here's a helix of DNA along, represented by these two lines. All the big hullabaloo about CRISPR is it breaks the DNA. That's all it does. It does so really efficiently and very precisely. So you can see these little uh, N, N, N bases and names in here. This specific sequence we can engineer in the lab. So we can build a CRISPR entirely synthetically in a laboratory and tell it where to bind on the double helix in your chromosome. So we can send that little payload exactly to that site and it works all the time. It always goes there. And what it does is it causes a break in the DNA. Its job is to break DNA. Now two things can happen and this happens to you every day. When you walk outside your DNA is being broken in your chromosome and the body has evolved this remarkable ability to repair the chromosome. It just slams the ends back together again. You go to the beach, um, you lay on the beach, you have x-rays and UV light that damages your chromosomes. That's why we have a lot more melanoma in this state, frankly, because of the great beaches. Nick Petrelli, head of the cancer center, always gives a lecture about how great the beaches are. Then he puts on suntan in front of everybody. And um, he's trying to represent that you go to the beach, you can really, uh, really damage yourself. But we survive that stuff because we're, the ability is to slam the two things back together again. In case, for some reason, and we don't know why, human cells have evolved to do this inaccurately. So it's like having these two, the, the DNA broken like this, and then for some reason, some of the DNA gets resected or lost before something gets slammed back together again. And that's a term, a fancy term, called non-homologous end joining. No idea where it came from, but it's there and everybody uses it. But if you think about this as the coding region of a gene, remember the letters inside a word, if we've broken the DNA and then we've lost some of those letters, the word is now misspelled or non-pronounceable. And that we call a genetic knockout. So when CRISPR breaks the DNA and the cell resects the sections, it generates a, a dysfunctional gene. And because we can engineer CRISPR to go exactly where it's supposed to go, the knockout can be achieved. And so we can knock genes out. I don't think there's a gene that it hasn't been knocked out in humans in all. There's only about maybe 3% of your genome is coding for genes, and I think every gene has now been knocked out in, a, in different animals, mice. They're, they're, it's almost all done because CRISPR is so efficient, and there's thousands of these things done every day. So um, here's kind of the platforms that we've, we've been talking about. And again, not to really kind of get into any of these in detail, but a lot of you, you see a, a, a lot of words on here, unknown, unknown, <laughs> unknown, difficult, <laughs> difficult, difficult. Oh, here's the easy, <laughs> um, positional, word, word worries me a lot, <laughs> uh, relatively easy. It's always hysterical in science. Those of you who are MDs or doctors have a career in science, nothing is relatively easy. It's usually not. Moderate difficulty, relatively easily. So the point is that we're, we're up against something that is real, a huge challenge. And the tools we have are so new and we're still working with them in such a way, but they are so powerful that people are moving ahead very dramatically. So we're kind of at a crossroads. We have incredible tools now. We have a responsibility to use them ethically, but the potential for what these tools can do to human health is unheard of and, and unmatched. And so these kind of the things that, that we have to deal with uh, kind of on a regular basis. It really, CRISPR really jumped on the scene in 1987, and that was really when people started to recognize these repeated sequences in bacterial DNA, and nobody knew what the hell they were all about. Well, it turned out that the bacterial cell was capturing pieces of viruses and sticking it into its DNA repetitively, and that's, that's the repetitive part of CRISPR. And so as time has gone on, there was sort of some activity, and then um, in 2011 and 2012, that's when the conceptual leap from a bacterial system nobody knew or cared much about went into human genetic engineering. And that was the start of things. And from there on in, 
uh, everything has exploded. And today, uh, there is um, just an unbelievable number of people uh, doing it. We are overwhelmed with requests for us making these tools and handing them over. Uh, we work with a couple of uh, major pharmaceutical companies that are knocking every gene out in their drug testing schemes um, to be able to find new drugs, particularly for diabetes, uh, which is a, <coughs> excuse me, a very hot area. So we're building tools for them. So it's been an explosion. But really, in the last sort of, you know, maybe five, six years, uh, the CRISPR has moved into the clinic, and I'll talk a little bit more about the clinical trials going on with CRISPR because they're actually pretty fascinating. What are we using it for? Well, um, we're very interested here in human health at Christiana Care, but it's been used actually more aggressively in a lot of other different ap for other different applications. Um, I've talked a little bit tonight about ex vivo in vivo gene therapy. Ex vivo hemophilia and sickle cell anemia are being treated already in humans. There are already clinical trials using CRISPR to cure sickle cell disease and hemophilia. And the word from sickle cell is incredibly good. Uh, the girls are cured. There is, they have no more. In fact, a couple of them, one was on 60 Minutes, I think not too long ago. You might have seen her. Uh, she's playing basketball. She could barely walk in the gym. Now she's playing basketball. In vivo, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, HIV is very successfully treated with uh, CRISPR, uh, HBV, and um, cystic fibrosis, a very aggressive uh, activity in those areas. Synthetic biology, rice, wheat, sorghum, tobacco, every, every type of plant has been modified by CRISPR. For what? Reduce pesticide uh, requirements, uh, prevent insect, uh, insect burdens, um, Monsanto and DuPont Dow, if they can grow an acre more of corn, it's a huge advantage to them. And a lot of times the weeds get between the corn stalks or the soybean. And so they've used CRISPR to make those plants resistant to any sort of um, uh, chemical so they can spray the fields and only the weeds die. This is true for Roundup, but it wasn't quite, quite true for, for crops in general. Um, this drug targets and phenotypes, we do a lot of work in here. Um, inherited diseases, cancer, so we're heavily involved in cancer, and I'll talk a lot about that, and this is us, uh, lung cancer, Ewing sarcoma lymphoma, and acute myeloid leukemia have all being treated now openly with cancer. So, and there's a fair amount of press around this stuff, uh, which is good and bad, frankly. So I prefer not to do that. We have uh, people hovering a little bit, so we'll, we'll let them know when something good happens. Um, so. This kind of gets you a little bit into the danger. So everything I've talked about so far and everything that is legal in the United States is to treat people, adults in particular, who are uh, suffering from a genetic disease or cancer in what we call a somatic disease way. So if you have a tumor in your lung, that's called a somatic. So that means if I modify that, you're not going to pass that on to a progeny. The problem is that the same tools can be used in fertilized eggs, in sperm. They're very effective in sperm, knocking um, male, uh, it, you know, even haploid genomes out. Um, and so once you start to move backwards up to the ultimate stem cell that all of us were created by one fertilized egg, now you start to get into questions about redesigning children. And uh, we'll talk about the Chinese case uh, in here in a little while. But nobody thought it was possible until he actually did it, supposedly. So um, in terms of that, we call that reprogramming, which means that we can reprogram genes and cells from your skin it become stem cells. And that's a technology that's widely available now. So if I were to take a skin cell off anyone here, it would take us a couple of weeks, so we could reprogram it into a stem cell. Then we can edit it and make a copy of you that's twice as tall or <laughs> twice as small or with blue eyes, brown hair, or whatever. So characteristics can be altered, and that's what we're finding out. Everybody used to think that was really hard, and that's why we wouldn't do it. It turns out, unfortunately, it's not hard. Oh, there are key genes now. And the area that that is becoming more interesting in for people is in pain relief. So there are only a couple genes that are involved in pain now, and so those are being knocked out. This is just kind of a summary of disease modeling and precision therapy. You'll hear the word precision medicine a lot uh, in the literature now and it, on the popular press. So this is all stuff that goes on daily and is legal. 
it's this stuff here that ends up to be illegal in the United States and also to be uh, unethical. So we'll get in a little bit more to that in the future. Here are the trials. Um, Duchenne's hemophilia, x -Kid, HIV, hepatitis B, these are all in motion now. And <coughs> as I mentioned, the sickle cell anemia trial has actually been taken off this because it's been viewed as a success. So um, these are all underway. So when people say, when is it going to reach the clinic, it's in the clinic now. It's a question of the, the bigger problem is that how do you get it out to the general public? Where are people going to be treated with it? How many people are going to be comfortable uh, having that? And will it reach the people who most need it? And that's always a challenge in healthcare delivery. We call that here at Christiana healthcare delivery. A uh, very cool picture uh, basically says we can do anything with a gene. We can um, insert or replace DNA. We can silence a gene. So if a gene is out of control, uh, making too much of its own product, we can knock it off. We can activate genes. This is actually being done for a sickle cell in a different way. It turns out that if you have, there are people who have sickle cell disease who don't show any symptoms. And that's been puzzling for people for years. They, the genetic mutation is there, and yet they're perfectly fine. And the reason they're fine is their embryonic gene uh, known as the fetal globin gene, has never stopped making fetal globin. So it turns out if you could make enough fetal globin in patients, they'd be cured of sickle cell disease. So there are people in a company called CRISPR Therapeutics, what else would they be called, uh, is doing a major trial in Europe on this exact tack. Uh, we can modify epigenetic modifications. That's how your DNA looks. And we can also label genes and find out where they move during differentiation and when you develop. So incredible amounts of CRISPR-Cas9 applications. We all want to know about the therapy side, but it's the research and development side in which CRISPR has captivated the, the genetic world and, and is used very efficiently. So here's some of the uh, challenges and things that, that we're facing. As I mentioned, in most cases, if you go into a, um, if you have a certain kind of anemia, they will normally take out your bone marrow, they'll treat it somehow and put it back in. So this is really no different than that, except in this case what we're doing is modifying the gene. So the gene behaves properly. It makes normal hemoglobin as opposed to sickle globin. And so that's really already in place. The structures of doing bone marrow and transfusion are there. So you're just adding this extra step, this genetic correction. Sometimes it's called gene repair, genetic correction, gene correction. So that's kind of how that whole thing is going, and people are, are able to, to do this because this is pretty straightforward. So having said it straightforward now, we start to enter into the world of is it ethical to do this? And I've actually been uh, involved in more panels on this question on, on the science. Um, and I have a great colleague at Hopkins named uh, Deb Matthews, who's really a first-rate ethicist, and uh, she's, she's really quite good on this. She was involved a lot in the early stem cell work, and uh, she's actually part, we, we have, she's the ethicist on our team, and so she's constantly haranguing me with dumb questions, and I try to ignore her calls all the time, but she won't give up. And she's very interesting. If you listen to Fresh Air on NPR, she's oftentimes on, on there. Um, she's very, very good. And, uh, she's, she's, and she's also well-balanced. She realizes that what we think as being ethical of all us healthy people in this room, I hope, is unethical for people who are dying of cancer. So there are many people who have stage 3 lung cancer who have no option and want to, uh, want to continue to live and see their daughter graduate from high school, perhaps take a trip with their wife or girlfriend or partner, doesn't matter. That's the goal. The goal here is to help those folks along who are willing to try this and try to avoid children. So why is that? Because children are the most apt to have other mutations occur in this process. We'll talk about off-site mutations. That's what The Economist is really talking about. We can recreate uh, this child to make it a better sprinter, a great singer, 20-20 uh, vision, high IQ, no baldness, maybe, no, <laughs> a low risk of Alzheimer's. So MIT is trying uh, a trial. It's very interesting. It's a preventative CRISPR trial. 
So they're actually giving patients who have, have a history of Alzheimer's CRISPR to knock genes out in the brain that are more susceptible to developing the plaques or creating the plaques. We'll see how that goes. There's a big problem with that, and, and Matthews has talked a lot about this. You're actually creating mutations in a normal patient. You're not fixing it. There's no problem with these people other than, you know, they, they have a propensity to, to develop Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So there's a question of whether or not you'd actually want to try an experimental uh, medicine to actually prevent yourself from getting into these really horrible long-term diseases. So incredible questions have arisen. These questions have already been here. I used to get these in early 2000s, but nobody thought it was going to work, to be honest. It was a great tool. We did a lot of, I think, really good science on how it works. We figured out the mechanism. But in terms of applications, until CRISPR came along, people thought this was just really cool science and for science geeks and people like that, but not would affect anything. Everything changed in 2014 because of the efficiency with which CRISPR works. That's why you see articles in The Economist talking about a genetic tool. Um, and there's actually big money around that. So here's how people actually do it and re-engineer children. Um, in most cases, people will say that if a, an oocyte or a zygote, which is basically a fertilized egg in all these cases, you can isolate those so an in vitro fertilization clinic can do this. They'll take the egg, they'll hold it with a suction tube. I don't think I have a picture of that. It's on one end, the tube is sucked here and then the needle comes in as it is here and injects CRISPR-Cas9. So the CRISPR then changes all of the cells in there and the embryo begins to develop. Now the difference with this is that in every case where, where I would treat a patient with cystic fibrosis or muscular dystrophy in the muscle, which is already a muscle and can't go on, that's the only place that that altered tissue or muscle would stay. In this case, every cell in your body, including your egg or sperm or your germline that you pass on to your children is changed. That's the problem. So that's what we call germline editing. And that's what a lot of publicity gets on because people are playing around with this. But it's not funded by the National Institutes of Health. No drug, no application will be, uh, will be approved. But interestingly, it's not illegal. <laughs> So you are not going to be hauled off to jail for editing. I think this is really hysterical. You don't pay your parking tickets for two years. They drag you into jail. But if you re-edit you know, re a human embryo, as long as you don't get any funding for it, it's kind of OK. So that's kind of, that's kind of the way things are. Now, interestingly, in Britain, uh, the government is funding germline editing. So they are far, far down the road. And China, which has great science, uh, is very unregulated. And so we don't really know what's happening there, as we heard about uh, not too long ago. So uh, germline editing is, is actually occurring in the world. And so our greatest fear about uh, designer children is actually coming true. Now, whether we can really make this work and, and design the type of children that we want, uh, I don't know. But, um, but this is the tool CRISPR can do this. And this is why this has arisen. So um, engineering large animals. Cliff Steer also talked to me the other day about a, f a fascinating thing they did in Minnesota. So a bunch of geneticists took CRISPR and knocked out the genes that give cows horns. How many people in this room know cows are born with horns? I didn't either, you know. Good. I'm glad somebody verified that because I'm always afraid when I say something and it could be total bullshit because Steer is, I think it's funny his name is Steer and he's talking about cows. Um, but the problem with them is that they can gore each other. And so there's a gene that they've knocked out in these, in these cow embryos, and they're making herds of cows without horns. And it's a huge, apparently this is a big economic boon. And that's basically re-engineering large animals. Um, crop editing, we've talked about. Those are the kind of things that uh, basically people are re restructuring food products and stuff like that. So what are the real risks? Um, there's a lot of controversy in the field now, um, and it swings all the way from 
uh, moratoriums on gene editing, moratoriums on cancer therapy, moratoriums on uh, forward mutations. That's the, the, when we call a forward mutation, that's something like the Alzheimer's trial where we're, we're, prevent, we're causing a preventative measure so you don't, you don't get it. You know, sadly, we've read, you know, about, um, I think it was Angelina Jolie who had a double mastectomy because her mother had a breast cancer mutation or so. That's a serious preventative measure, but that's the kind of thing that, that people might be willing to do to stop themselves from getting a genetic disease, even if they have no, no signs of it. And, and that's with CRISPR, it's now possible to do that kind of thing. Uh, to CRISPR, not to CRISPR, ethical debates are arising, as I mentioned. There are huge conferences all over the world about this in, in particular. Um, the government is involved in biosafety training. Uh, we have certain rules. We have um, our laboratories. Uh, if you, uh, any of you would like a tour, just uh, you can email me, and we have a number of people in the lab that will take you through. Uh, there are uh, hoods which are packed into the back of the room where no one is accessed. The doors are closed, and so you have to go through a series of doors to get in there. Not that there's anything that's infectious or anything, it's just that the contamination that can come in there with, with people are, is little much. So there's lots of biosafety uh, that goes in there, um, on in here. So people are being as careful as, careful as they can. And uh, the U.S. intelligence community, it sounds like uh, oxymoron, but I guess it's there. Um, and uh, I don't know if you remember who James, well, of course you remember who James Clapper is. He's in the news every day now. Um, so Clapper gave this testimony in, I think, 2016 or so, and he called CRISPR a weapon of mass destruction. So the U.S. Intelligence Committee believes that CRISPR could be used in a, in a warlike setting. How's that possible? So they feel it could be dumped into the water system and could modify the bacteria and the algae in there, which can then produce all kinds of toxins which can enter the United States water system. So there are now tests of most of the aquifers going on to make sure there isn't CRISPR running around in there inside a bacterial cell. So um, people are taking it pretty seriously. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it sounds, sounds good. Safety is always good. You can't, it's like, you know, you can't argue against safety. It's important. So um, the National Academies of Science have focused expressly on this in the last several years. And they have put together a series of rules and regulations which govern those of us who work with this uh, panel. Um, and these, these rules are pretty, they, they're pretty fluid. They, they tend to change a lot. And sadly, they change in kind of the wrong direction. Um, the people who make up these panels are really top-notch scientists. And so they think science is really cool. So if somebody does something that kind of borders on the end, they, they tend not to pull them back, they move the goalposts a little bit. So there's some concern as to how far is this really going to go. And now the ethicists around the country are stepping up. This is not a religious question. This is just fundamental ethics of dealing with, with human cells. Um, they're starting to enter into the fray a little more. So it's less science, more ethics now. Here are some, um, some basic things, and I'm not going to go through them. Uh, all. So the one that's most interesting, I think, is the germline heritable gene editing. About five years ago, this was not allowed in the United States. But last year, to everyone's surprise, they decided that if you know a child is going to suffer, um, it is unborn child, is going to suffer with a particular genetic disease, it is possible, under very strict conditions, that you would be able to do gene editing on a fertilized egg in the United States. Um, it's, that's what I taught. The, the goalpost shifted just a little. It's kind of subtle. And I don't know if this has happened yet, but um, this is definitely a little troubling to a lot of us, for sure. Here's all the somatic cell gene editing. Uh, regulatory processes are in place. Clinical trials of therapies, prevention of disability, evaluate safety. These are all standard things. If you were to develop a new drug for headaches or something, you'd go through these kind of things, and, and these are actually pretty good. As I'm going to tell you about later, the FDA is still a little confused about how to, how to go through this. So, um, and that's, uh, that's a little troubling <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Here's a great thing, enhancement. So when I was younger, it would certainly been, wouldn't have been opposed to any enhancement. 
Um, but, you know, athletic prowess, um, looking like George Clooney, uh, changing the way that you, your height, your weight, uh, your abilities, uh, that's completely prohibited. So what's prohibited is trying to make LeBron James here. Um, but here, if you're treating a disease, and I can tell you from my years in science in this area, that this is a very slippery slope. Uh, the only way to, to not to do this is not to do this. There should be no exceptions because as things go forward, you'll slowly, things will say, well, enhancement, well, not really. And then suddenly we have normal children being born with the great skills of LeBron James or, or any sort of uh, other incredible athlete. So um, stay tuned on this. This is a fascinating area that's, that's morphing in a direction that a lot of us are uncomfortable with. So um, I've been talking about this, and I'm, you, some of you may not know what actually happened here, so I apologize. But uh, over the summer, at a, con as a conference in, uh, in the Far East, I believe it was either Singapore or Hong Kong, I'm blanking on where it was, um, a scientist who is an entrepreneur uh, who had no funding for this claimed that he had taken twins from a fertilized clinic and knocked out the gene that causes HIV to infect people. So it's a great idea, by the way, and it's actually being done somatically by a company called Sangamo in, in San Diego. And he announced this, and the shocking thing was that he, uh, nobody knew he was doing this. Um, now, a number of U.S. scientists actually knew of him. He had spent some time in their labs that he went back and he created this. And um, it was so unique and different that the entire scientific community condemned it immediately. Um, he was removed from his laboratory and put in isolation. And um, what I understand in China, that's not a great place to be, uh, for sure. Uh, but strangely enough, uh, the girls, I believe they're twin girls, according to research, are doing pretty well. And in fact, are doing a lot better than normal children. So the one gene he knocked out not only made them resistance to HIV forever, they're healthier, they appear to be smarter, they, everything seems to be enhanced, which is the worst news in the world for people who oppose germline editing. So the Chinese government uh, developed, now you saw the complexity of the United States rules. Um, they were inundated with bad press, and the Chinese have excellent science, there's no question. but the regulations there are a little bit, you know, loose. So <clears throat> even as I mentioned, the slippery slope is here again. Mercy for families in need. <laughs> Only for serious disease, never vanity. All, all true, but the definitions of what that means are kind of lacking. Okay? So this was a stunning piece of technology development and uh, people are still kind of talking about it. But what it did was it launched the American and the European bodies into following this much more tightly. So um, ethical things are on the minds of a lot of people. The fact is you can use CRISPR to change uh, unborn children. You can, at, at the one or two cell stage, which is really amazing. And you can supposedly, in the great news, you could eliminate every genetic disease there is by changing the child before uh, he or she is born. So this is amazing. Okay, so this is a this is a survey that I could edit my eyes; it'd be great. But this is a survey that um, the uh, I believe this was either the Pew Foundation or uh, I think University of Wisconsin ran. Now, the first question is, how much do you agree with the use of at a gene editing in children or adults to cure threatening disease? So I, I would imagine everybody in here would probably be on the strongly agree side. Here's the neutral, don't know, here's the negative stuff. Children or adults to cure debilitating disease, that's cancer, okay? All good. Embryos to prevent a life-threatening disease. Embryos, there's no change. So while some of you may be shocked at this, what I just told you, the vast majority of Americans agree that genetic manipulation in embryos is okay. Debilitating, and here's the one that has shocked everybody. 
embryos to alter any non-disease characteristic. This is the, what we call the LeBron James syndrome. <laughs> we'd all like to play basketball like LeBron. Actually, we'd like to be like LeBron. He's a very bright guy. Look at this. It's split 50-50. So this means that half the population in the United States find it okay to create designer children. And that's uh, something that really is, is astonishing to, to a lot of us. Um, we don't know. We don't know where this is going, but it's now become kind of front and center. I'm not always sure that people really understand the questions of surveys and the implications. Um, and a lot of people like me don't want to answer questions, so we run down and they, we, and we say yes or no just to get rid of people. Um, so maybe this is something to think about. But it is uh, astonishing that people uh, in this country, half of us, actually believe that re restructuring non, this, this means hair color, eye color, things like that. If all the genes known, that we knew all those genes and changed them, we could actually be able to gene edit them. And about half the population thinks it's okay. Uh, here's where I went wrong early on. Uh, this was the 1980s, I think, right? I wasn't born then, so I, my wife told me about this uh, thing here. So things can go very wrong, um, but it certainly is everywhere. So I'm going to stop there and maybe take a few questions and then give you guys a break. We're almost on time. It's amazing. And then when we come back, I'll tell you a little bit more details about how we're using CRISPR and, and a little bit more about how it works. So um, anyway, so uh, any questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the, the only challenge with neurodevelopment so far is that it's very hard to have CRISPR enter neurons. Neurons tend to, they don't take foreign things up very well, other than small pharmaceuticals. So incredible amount of work on there, um, for sure. And obviously the Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, advanced stuff, people think. And they're doing that by injecting it at the base of the brain stem. You know, it used to be when I was in college, um, People thought nothing could ever cross the blood-brain barrier. In fact, um, a couple Nobel Prizes were given for that. It turns out to be entirely wrong. Uh, things pass through there all the time. And so I think there's a lot of hope now that uh, at some point CRISPR will be able to use. But it's still a challenge because neuronal tissue tends to be very refractory to the uptake of things from the outside. So fingers crossed. So Yes? Yeah. To create stem cells. And I'm wondering if you can use that type of science to grow new organs for people yes. who are on organs. Yeah, but there's a better way. So the second half, I'll tell you the better way. I'll give you a hint. It, they're, they're growing them in pigs. So that's not a good, I know, it's terrible. I mean, uh, I, I know people who are two-legged pigs, but, you know, now we're going to get them from four. No, uh, absolutely true. So theoretically... You can take a, a skin cell and de-differentiate it all the way back to the primordial cell. Now, the primordial cell is a matter of great contention now. Nobody wants to admit they have it or not, but they can get it to a point where if you now add a magic cocktail of hormones, you can differentiate it into lung tissue, into pancreas, and you can rebuild organs that way. Absolutely. The faster way to do it is to engineer a pig so, it, so a human doesn't reject it, doesn't reject the organ. And so... That tends to be where people are headed, but you could absolutely do that. Mice, mice are created all the time that way. Yes? No, I, I'm sorry, I, I was unclear. If you take it, your skin cell and put it back in, the body will not reject it. But if you uh, take an organ from a pig, the, the reason a pig is chosen is this is not a comforting thought. Pig organs are about the same size as ours. And so the spatial arrangement of your body, you can't put an organ that's this big, like from a rabbit or something in it, even though it might work better. You have to your body or you know, you'll kind of sink in and stuff like that. So uh, the pig organ is chosen. Now, the problem with the pig organ is, A, it would be rejected, as, as you said, by a human. But pigs bring along with them a lot of viruses. And so CRISPR is being used to generate pigs uh, that are born at a fertilized egg, and they know what the virus is. So they knock all 40 viruses out one at a time. 
and then they breed these pigs and they grow and it's almost done. There are, there's a herd of pigs. Is it a herd of pigs or a pod of pigs or whatever? A group of pigs. I gotta be careful in these days. <laughs> um, and so they are available now and the first transplants should be in the next couple of years, probably this year. So it's harvesting organs that way because it actually, it was done primarily because of the, or, the lack of human organ donors. And so this is solving, solving that problem. But the, the advantage of CRISPR is it's able to reduce all of the rejection and the viruses very efficiently, which hadn't been possible in the past. So it's a good question. Yes? Um, you said before the AAV virus can't distinguish between healthy cells or like or Right, cancer or normal yeah. cells. And yeah. you said, yeah, are you more, like, is there some idea of how it could distinguish between Yeah, them? so we're, we're, we're very, so adenovirus, AAV is complex. It has a, a series of serotypes, which means that People in this room probably have up to 12 different kinds of AAV because it's evolved based on the person it infects. We call that a serotype. There are some serotypes which appear to be able to sort of tell between a normal tumor, a tumor cell and a normal cell by the number of receptors that are on the cell surface. So it's really not a clever way to do it. It's like a mass action thing. There's more here than there, so more, it, it has a better chance of getting in, getting in there. We found out, I'm going to talk about lung cancer and what we're doing with that, and a young graduate student, I think she's 22 years old, may have solved this problem. Um, and she showed it to me, she's one of my graduates, she showed it to me in a matter-of-fact way with a piece of paper. She said, I think if we do this, it'll work, and I'll be damned if so far it has worked. So I'll tell you about that in the second half. So a lot of this stuff you might think is really smart, <laughs> but it really isn't. <laughs> It's just there's a lot more in this bucket and then in here, and guess what? If there's more of this crap here, that's where it's going to go. So that's the only way to sort of do it that I know of yet. So would play a major role in um, cancer treatment? Yes. We hope so. We hope so. Yes? Should one be concerned about eating genetically modified Uh, there is. Uh, I think the, you know, that's, you see it in the grocery stores all the time. Um, Europe is very sensitive to this. Some countries won't allow the sale of those kinds of things. Uh, we don't know of anything that's really caused a negative. I tend to be neutral on this stuff. I feel that's a personal decision. So far, there hasn't been any disease related to genetically modified or food or organisms, but we, we just don't know the rules, but there is definitely a fair bit of pushback on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, what is the cost of certain treatments like this? <laughs> right. And so, in addition, it just seems like it's not a pill that we're going to take. I mean, there's other factors to deliver. Yeah. Right. Janice Nevin asks me that question all the time. She's the CEO here. She was in our lab on Friday and asked me that question. Um, we don't know. Uh, the, only, uh, the only guidance I can give is that the CAR T cell therapy, which is currently being offered, is half a million dollars a shot. Now, that sounds terrible, and of course it is. And nobody's paying for it yet. But it's cancer treatment one time. So if you take your cancer treatments over 10 to 20 years, it's a lot more than half a million dollars. Insurance companies are kind of coming around to it. I've heard Aetna might start funding this. So what's happened is Novartis has the treatment. They're the main CAR-T therapy. So we have them over, and the, we treat over in the cancer center. I don't do it, but very talented doctors do it over there. Uh, and Novartis is currently paying for it. Um, from what I understand, it's almost completely perfect. Everyone who takes it is, is cured. So the question is, who's going to pay for it, and will the costs go down? Novartis did a funny thing. Well, it's not funny. It was ironic. They came out with it, and they priced it at $750,000, and people just fell off the thing, and they said, okay, okay, half a million. And I thought, <laughs> you know, what we want is $10,000, you know. So uh, you've, you've just asked a question that hospitals are asking for every kind of genetic medicine. This is really cool science, but when you transfer it into practical use, it's very expensive. I don't think there's anything else that's really going to be used for it. The, the edge of your question, which is very good, is in fact that 
um, making enough of this stuff. So pharmaceuticals are basically a chemical reaction, very effective. Drug companies know how to make chemicals. You know, you see these, these billion cell uh, pills coming out. But this is a, really a biological material because it involves a protein called Cas9. And how do you make enough of that? And we don't know that yet. So that's, that's another barrier. It's called scale up. How do we scale up enough so we can actually make that? Um, I think CRISPR will probably go into practice uh, in small numbers for about a year or two. And then hopefully an insurance company will begin to pick it up. Because the attraction is that you're not going to have to treat this patient or that patient's core more. Remember, as patients age with a genetic disease, they get many more problems. So you're not just treated for that genetic disease, you're treated for fung sickle cell patients have a terrible time. They're in constant pain, it's a terrible disease. Uh, it's an orphan disease, only about 50,000 people in the United States have it, yet it's incredibly famous. They have fungal infections, viral infections, so physicians have to treat those first uh, as opposed to just going after the base treatment. So stay tuned on that one. That's, uh, that occup there's a couple floors. <laughs> If you go down this building, go up to the eighth floor, there are people who spend all day thinking about that question. So I keep trying to hurry it up, you know, and they're not thinking hard enough. But it's, it's a great, it's a, it's a problem for sure. I mean, healthcare delivery in the country is changing very dramatic. Christiana is really very progressive. Janice Nevin is fabulous, not just because she's my boss. I'm, I'm being, are you recording this, Megan? Okay, so <laughs> Dr. Nevin is the finest. <laughs> no, she really is. She's actually very progressive and she's willing to listen to new things and she's moving Christiana Care very forward which, with better health care and patient focus. Um, but it's going to change. Things are not going to be the way they were, I'm sure. So That's why they pay those people the big money you know, and think about that stuff. So. Yes? 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 It's my understanding that the pharmaceutical industry is always struggling with where to put their millions of dollars yes. of research money right. because we're still in a capitalistic system where money counts and there's no moral <coughs> obligation to go socialistic and pick something off the board yeah. and do that one next. I live in Wilmington, very close to AstraZeneca. And I've watched them over the last five, ten years spend millions of dollars in real estate right. and then collapse, almost collapse. Right, and leave, yeah. What do they develop next, and are we going to buy it? There's something going on between this capitalistic and socialistic system yeah. and doing something that's morally and ethically yeah. correct. Yeah, I have nothing to add. You've said it as good as I could. Um, the uh, pharmaceutical companies have struggled with genetic medicine for a long time for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they like to you to keep buying the pill. So if you are cured with something, you're not going to buy the pill anymore. That's why Novartis doing this was quite a shock to everybody. Um, I think they see the end of their patents coming uh, on certain drugs. Uh, generic drugs are, are falling. Uh, they're going off patent. Uh, whatever you think of the Trump administration, the right to try rule is fabulous. Uh, that's new. That's going to allow a lot of this kind of stuff to move forward. That's the FDA has approved that. The bad news for us and for you and me is that the FDA commissioner, who was fabulous and wanted to drive prices down and doing it, just quit. And we don't know why. He's got that inevitable thing. He wants to spend more time with his family in, in Connecticut. So I just he's a young guy and he's great. And he's a huge fan of gene editing. So hopefully that will continue. Um, they do invest in research a lot, and they are actually investing in CRISPR, so we'll see. But uh, their motives are unclear because they have purchased a lot of good technologies in the past and buried them, meaning they buy them and license them and patent them. They buy the patents, and then they don't develop them, and they prevent anyone else from developing them. So it is a business, and they, you know, they're great, great commercials, though. I, I like them. I like the ones that are looking up at the ceiling and pulling the string down. Those are, those are great. But again, uh, you know, the, the researchers in there are, are, are very, very good. And, and they, they, they love science. They do great science. The business does crowd it in a little bit. And they do have to answer to shareholders. So 
We actually see that a little bit in the CRISPR field too. A, a lot of people have started biotechnology companies and a lot of times when they come to meetings they can't talk about their latest data because they don't want to breach a patent or something like that. So it can get a little challenging at times. Yep, an age-old question. I don't know if we're ever going to get there, but good to AOC. Maybe in 10 years or five years we'll be there. So, Okay, well, maybe you can take a five-minute break, and then hopefully you'll all come back, because I think you'll get better, I promise, in the second half. <laughs> okay, um, it's the second half now. So um, looks like we actually had... Most people came back. That's great. Um, so in, in, this, uh, in this section, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, the things that we're doing here and give you a little bit more insight into what it actually is and requires to edit a gene. So this will be a little sort of um, not so vague but more specific. Uh, this is a sampling of uh, major... Uh, uh, popular magazines that have focused on CRISPR um, and the list continues to grow on a uh, on a regular basis so it's uh, not un, uh, uh, uncommon to see it published everywhere um, so w the Gene Editing Institute is actually an independent uh, department in the Cancer Center and uh, and we do have to focus uh, not only on technology development, but also on patients. Uh, Christiana Care is uh, very, very forceful in thinking about the patient first. Um, and science is always a, a tendency to think about technology, but here that I can tell you that isn't the case. And we do not enter into a clinical trial or even a clinical um, research project without thinking about how we're going to deliver it that actually is not really a commercial, but it actually makes Christiana care a little bit different than most places, so, so that's a good thing. So uh, we began the Gene Editing Institute with four missions. The first was to focus on technology research and technology development translation research. Uh, we have a fair bit of funding from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation. Uh, we also have a mission to educate uh, college students, high school students, community college students in, uh, in gene editing. And so we've actually developed a curriculum that we are launching with our partners across the street, um, Dell Tech, uh, this fall, and uh, sending it out to four-year and two-year schools and even some high schools to be able to then do a laboratory exercise. Um, there are, we hold workshops for people from around the country. There's one tomorrow at Dell Tech excuse me, with instructors coming from around the country to learn how to do this. Uh, this is our tool making group. We're actually a core facility and we make uh, gene editing tools, CRISPR, for other researchers around the country. And uh, it actually turns out to be important that you actually develop some revenue. And so for that, uh, that tool making, uh, we actually commercialize some of those things. So. These are the four, and this is, these are all the partners uh, that we're currently involved in. I've changed this one down here. We're going to talk a little bit about this one in the end, because as I tried to convince you in the first uh, hour, uh, this area, what we call CRISPR gene editing 360, is a, is a wide-spanning circular look at the public policies, legal issues, <coughs> community outreach, and obviously the ethical implications. So we are concerned about this. It's not just about the science here at Christiana. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot about our lung cancer work. Uh, we've launched a cancer diagnostic. Here's the education thing. And these are the projects that we actually are working on right now uh, and actively in the lab. Uh, we've had a long-term project in sickle cell disease. Um, this has not been as uh, effective as we thought uh, in our hands, but, uh, but I'm glad to see other people are having it move a lot quicker but we are having some success in lung cancer, which, uh, which is moving along pretty well. So uh, I've been using this term forever. And what does it actually mean? So um, you don't really have to learn many of the details about this, but think about gene editing as if it were a, a word program. And you can either cut, paste, or change a word or a letter. And that's basically what we're doing with genes. Genes are, genes are a word. The bases are the letters. And so by cutting something, um, 
you are basically removing a gene and paste, uh, sorry, uh, cutting a word and changing a letter, pasting a letter and or changing it. In gene editing, we use CRISPR to delete bases or genes, insert genes, and replace genes. And all of these things are, are possible. These guys right here, the leptin gene is a gene that's involved in appetite. So CRISPR has knocked that gene out, and this, here he is, he's pretty happy. Uh, he's a little larger than his litter mate, but uh, he actually lives as long. This is very disappointing to the people who are interested in that. Um, here are some uh, green fluorescent mice. These are called nude mice. They don't have any coat. That's just their skin. This is the same litter, and half of them have had a arctic fish green fluorescent protein gene included in them, and if things don't work out, I'll be selling these at the Christiana Mall later tonight. <laughs> um, and then here is a colleague of mine, University of Nebraska, um, Dr. Guru Murthy, who's very, very good at CRISPR, actually was able to tag a green fluorescent protein gene onto a rhodopsin gene and knocked it into this mouse. It's only expressed in his eyes, and you turn the lights off, and this is probably the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life, uh, and he can see perfectly well. So it's really quite amazing. Um, you know, like cat's eyes in the darkest is uh, it's different. So these, these are much more expensive at the mall than these guys here. So. <laughs> so I often get asked, why hasn't this happened before? Why haven't you been able to do something? So here's, here's the real problem. Imagine a book with a thousand pages. Each page contains 1,000 words. Now imagine 3,000 of these books. All those words represent all the genetic information in the animal body. Gene targeting allows scientists to pinpoint one word on page 91 in volume 1,349. That's how big the challenge is. And CRISPR can find that one word on page 91 in volume 1,349. So that's the problem and the challenge that we've had. And until we had a series of these remarkable tools, most notably CRISPR, we couldn't find that word as efficiently as we can now. So that's what everyone was up against. Here's our friends again, uh, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you in the next couple slides why people use CRISPR, but you can probably figure it out from this picture. Uh, this is, these are our zinc fingers. They're actually two pieces. They're two proteins. This is a, it looks like a cord of cable. Here is a talon, and here's CRISPR, a, p a single string and a big blob. It's just easier to make, and it works better. These, we, we've spent a lot of time working with talons as well in our lab. We still do them. They're complicated. They work pretty well. They're just hard to make. Now, <clears throat> this is a complete lie. I do, not I do not know if this is the evolution of the Swiss Army knife, <laughs> but um, I was able to kind of piece together a series of um, edges uh, that go from a blunt instrument all the way up to the very complex Swiss Army uh, knife here. And we think about this as the evolution of gene editing. Um, in 1999 and before, uh, we were working in here, and we've actually progressed a long work. You know, some of my competitors think I still work down here, <laughs> which, is, which is okay. Uh, I think they work down there too, so it's, it's equal. But, uh, but inevitably, this, this kind of advancement really happened over five years. And that's when a tool comes along that's a breakthrough technology like CRISPR, it changes the entire field, and, and that certainly has. So I mentioned earlier, there was a great question over here, what else will, they ha will you have to do? And, and here's the answer. So if someone comes into a clinical trial, or we're going to use this patient, we're going to need to design it correctly, we're going to have to build it, the speed at which we build it counts, and can we scale it up? You can get a lot of stuff to work in mice but and rats. Now, there are plenty of two-legged rats, too, walking around, but they tend to be bigger than the four-legged ones. And so it's hard to scale everything up. Everything works in mice. As Nick Petrelli says, cancer has been cured in mice for 35 years. Uh, the problem is that you can't make enough of the, of the vehicle or the tool to make it work in humans. So in terms of designing, Zinc fingers are complex, talons are less complex, and even I can draw this <laughs> with a CRISPR. Building them. 
Uh, pretty complex, complex, and even I could probably build that with some help. Speed. Six months to build a zinc finger nucleus, one. Takes about a week to two weeks if you're good at it. We do these in two hours. So we can build a CRISPR and have it, in, we can build a CRISPR, order it from a house in Iowa that actually does the chemistry. We have it overnight. We'll start the experiment the next morning. And scalability is readily possible with CRISPR, very difficult and only possible with Talon. So if someone here uh, asked me kind of just a translation of this, and while science is very exciting and good, you have to think about uh, does it end at just good science and innovation and discovery, or is it translatable? Everybody likes to talk about their own translational research, but most people aren't really, um, because they have to worry about this stuff here. This kills a lot of really good science that is for knowledge's sake, and it helps in other things. But in terms of getting it to the patient, these are the four things that we have to think about very carefully. So here's an actual picture of the CRISPR. Uh, here's a little gold man carrying scissors. Uh, this was photographed yesterday afternoon. We caught him walking down the street. Um, so CRISPR takes two, two parts. It's, and, it, and again, I, you know, I know it's, it's sometimes hard to relate to this, but it really is simple. <laughs> it is a protein called Cas9 that is a molecular scissor that cuts DNA right like that. It snaps it right in half. And all it was waiting for was a CRISPR, which is a piece of nucleic acid called RNA, and it carries those guys, marches along the chromosome, literally it tracks, it rolls along the chromosome until it finds that one site and it cuts the DNA at that site. That's what's a miracle. This happens in about 0.2 nanoseconds once, the, once it gets into the cell. So it's diffusion controlled if those of you guys who spent some time in the industry know that that's about as fast as it goes. So pretty amazing. So where did it come from? So as I mentioned to you before, it actually came from scientists studying the fermentation of milk. Um, and um, they noticed that this was happening. So this is a bacterial cell itself. And it is inundated with viral infections. It doesn't seem like you know um, bacteria would care about viruses, but they get infected too. We call them bacteriophages. It's a, it's a, a Greek or Latin word that that stands, uh, basically represents viruses. So this little satellite-like creature is a virus and it sits down on the bacterial cell and it injects its DNA in. So the cell, bacterial cell, protects itself by chopping up the DNA as fast as it can. Now we used to think, and when I was in graduate school, that this DNA was just somehow spit out by the cell into the medium, but it turns out that's not what happens. It actually takes pe the bacterial cell takes pieces of DNA and sticks it in its one chromosome. Bacteria have one chromosome. And it arranges it in a way so that the next time that the virus infects here in step five, same virus, that makes CRISPR. So a little piece of RNA comes off, the cast protein sitting in there, it makes this ugly little thing that looks like a little marshmallow, and it goes flying up and it cuts the DNA very specifically. Why do, what do we call this bacterial immunity? It's the same thing. You get infected with a virus, you develop an antibody. Next time you get infected, the antibody. That's the whole point of vaccination. Bacterial cells have been doing this forever. But instead of an antibody, they use CRISPR-Cas. The, the number nine is one type <coughs> excuse me, of Cas protein, and it's the most common one, but it's called CRISPR-Cas. So that's where it's all come from. And people had known about this reaction for a very long time, but it took until about nine, uh, 2012 when people started to say, I wonder if this guy right here, the CRISPR-Cas molecule, can actually go and edit human DNA. And obviously the answer is yes. Okay, so in essence what's happened here is that uh, Jennifer Doudna um, and Emmanuel Chapontier, um, both very good scientists, um, decided to repurpose um, the bacterial um, gene, or the bacterial vaccine and immunity. And we've done this many times in our lives, and repurposing is inventing or developed for one purpose, but is later modified to be useful for another purpose. Does anyone know what Coke was originally intended to do? <laughs> okay. 
So it was an alternative uh, to morphine addiction and treat headaches and anxiety. Now we think it causes headaches and anxiety, especially the price, actually, right? So. What about Listerine? This one is not good. <laughs> it was a cure for gonorrhea. So next time you buy a bottle of Listerine, go a little slower. <laughs> And the most famous drug ever repurposed for anything was, of course, Viagra, which was originally designed uh, to, yeah, to reduce uh, heart ailments in men. And it actually was in a clinical trial in China. And the Chinese nurses noticed something very unusual about people <laughs> on this trial. So, heard it, yeah. So, anyway, there's too many bad jokes, and it's too late, so I'm going to leave it there. Right, so this is a three-dimensional picture of, of CRISPR, um, and the Cas9 protein is this big blue blob, and those of you who are old enough will make it look like a Pac-Man, which is about my level of gamesmanship still. And right in here along this, this is the little pink uh, sequence with the pegs. That's the, the uh, RNA that's going to grab onto the, see, I'm going to go back here and hold it. So if you look down the low here, this is the DNA would come in at an angle in a helix. And what's happened is that the CRISPR RNA now binds onto this and grabs it in place. And then this little thing right here, where you see it elevated, that's the shark's tooth. And it goes down and cuts the DNA right there. It's a magnificent machine. It is, could not be designed better. It's, it's stunning in its, in its simplicity and elegance from a, from a uh, it's been crystallized, it's been studied, uh, probably every amino acid uh, encoded by a gene has been modified in here to make it work more. It's a really beautiful diagram. Uh, here's what it does, it cuts DNA. Now remember I told you that when CRISPR cuts the double-stranded DNA, basically here's an example of what I meant by resection. Here's the DNA being cut, and those things are removed just by being broken. And, we may, and you can make a deletion in there. Now, let's say that you wanted to repair a mutation. You'd cut the DNA again, and then you add some excess DNA that had the corrected gene in it, and through some magical stuff, it would actually put itself into the gene corrected. And so this kind of a thing here is extremely difficult to do. We, we work on this problem all the time. But all CRISPR does, and this is, a really, this is what kind of shocks most people that hear this, it just breaks DNA very specifically. It does nothing else. It doesn't remove DNA. It, it breaks the DNA. It sits there for a while, and then it goes away. The cell does everything else. Okay. So when we started thinking about lung cancer, um, we started to form a team here. Um, and we've now evolved this in what's known as precision population health. And I want to going to talk now for a few slides about our approach to lung cancer. So, um, I'd like to tell you that CRISPR and the way we're going to treat cancer patients here is the solution to lung cancer, but it's not. Stop smoking. That's the solution to most lung cancer. Not all. Uh, a lot of people get initiated tumors. So you cannot have a lung cancer program without having experts in smoking cessation. There are um, all kinds of wild things going on. There are people who have uh, quit smoking who are uh, who buy this app that goes on their watch, and the app will go off if they enter a place that sells tobacco. So if you're walking down the street and, the, and there's a convenience store that sells tobacco, just to prevent you from being drawn to buy cigarettes, it'll stop, it'll, it'll ping you here. So incredibly wild stuff, but that's really where you've got to stop the problem. We, we are very anxious and hopeful and stuff like that, but frankly, in any sort of population health program, it really has to begin by behavior changes in lung cancer. It's a terrible, terrible uh, disease, but we think by combining population health that way and then using some, some pretty sexy state-of-the-art kind of uh, therapies, we should be able to make a dent in lung cancer. It's the number one killer in the state of Delaware by far. It's the number one killer nationally. There are more people killed by lung cancer than breast, prostate, and um, most other kind of solid tumors combined. And yet there's very little treatment for lung cancer. We do know that smoking definitely uh, activates it and moves it forward very quickly. So there is some help 
if you simply, and you can do that at any time. People have smoked for many years. My father smoked after the war, World War II, for many years, and then one day stopped. And that was it. He, he died at 93 years old. So he, and he never had any lung cancer. Obviously, that's some genetics. So it, it can work. I mean, it really can, it can, it can work if you, if you change your behavior. Now, here's the problem. It's been around a long time. And um, I'm not sure, I actually got this from a psychologist here in the upstairs named Scott Siegel, who's very smart. And when he showed this, I thought, this makes a lot of sense, because the whole thing was they get covered up with ash. <laughs> and it's definitely from cigarettes. So, And there they are. That's a rare photo. Um, this is actually um, Gary Larson was the photographer. And uh, he was there, and he took this picture. So uh, this is just challenge. This is what we're up against, just so you know. This has been around for multiple millions of years. So, so here's our approach. Um, I don't think CRISPR is going to work by itself in just about any form of cancer. And the reason that is is the cancer cell changes continuously. It's called a forward mutator phenotype. People have known this for years. So as a cancer cell grows in your body, it divides quickly. And because it's dividing abnormally quickly, the DNA replication machine that replicates your chromosomes makes mistakes. And because it's forced to divide, it leaves the mistakes behind. In normal tissue, it doesn't divide as fast. It kind of checks and it's this balancing act. So what we felt was when we started thinking about lung cancer, especially after the medical director of the cancer center said, I want you to work on lung cancer, we immediately thought we'd work on lung cancer. Um, we engaged oncologists from around the, the cancer center. And the first line of defense, although it's changing a little bit, and, and I get pushback all the time on this, but the majority of people who have lung cancer, who present with lung cancer, are treated with chemotherapy right away. Normally, it's cisplatin and carboplatin, and these are drugs that were approved in 1976, and yet they're still the first line of defense. They work. They're just really hard to take. So what we felt was that we might be able to help augment that, that therapy by reducing the amount of tumor burden or chemotherapy the patient has to take. So the idea is pretty simple, that we knock out a gene known as NRF2, and I'll show you that gene in a second. That's the gene that's responsible for chemo resistance. I don't know how many of you um, have friends, I hope none, hope no one has a friend like this, who has lung cancer, God forbid you've had it. But what happens is that you're treated with chemotherapy for about two weeks on heavy dosages, and you come back and you feel, you know, you're out, it looks good, then it comes back. And it's, it's you know, lung cancer is the worst because the, the tumor is growing in the perfect place. Oxygen, nutrients, blood flow, it couldn't be a worse place to have a tumor. And so what happens is that the, the NRF2 gene is normally there to protect you from stressful conditions, and it thinks that chemotherapy is pretty stressful. So it stops the tumor cell from taking in chemotherapy. So we have to knock that gene out so that now the, the chemotherapy flows back into the tumor cells. And that's basically the approach. It's an augmentative therapy to help chemotherapy work better. And it sounds like low-hanging fruit, but it's about the only way that we can see to really get into this, into this um, problem. Now here are the team that is currently working on it. Um, this is Pavel. He is probably one of the top CRISPR guys in the country. He leads our, our design team, and it's the only time I have ever seen him with a tie. And I have to tell you, I'm looking more, it looks like it's photoshopped in here by one of his friends. <laughs> he does not dress like this at all. If he has a t-shirt on, I consider that to be a, vi a victory every day. Um, Greg Masters is the head of the oncology program in lung cancer and really one of the top docs in the country in lung cancer. Uh, he's supported very heavily by NCI. Uh, Mike Jamil, and uh, Yi Chen Wang is a health um, economist expert. She actually works mostly on Wall Street now, but she comes down two days a month to help us on this. And Pat Swanson is the nurse navigator. So uh, Pat has been terrific um, in helping us get going. And Jerry Castellano is very funny. He's the head of the internal review board. So this is the group that reviews to whether to go into patients or not. The look on Jerry's face is not when I told him what we were going to do, even though he <laughs> He kind of looks that way every time I'm going to come with you to a protocol, and I'm not sure what he's thinking there, but um, it doesn't look like it's very positive. 
Why NRF2? So NRF2 is a very interesting gene, and all you need to know is it's involved in cryoprotection and detoxification defense system. So it active, the minute you're on chemotherapy, this, this gene kicks on to protect you against the bad side of chemotherapy. The problem is, is that you want the bad side of chemotherapy to kill the tumor cell. So the idea is that we knock this guy out, and now the chemotherapy will be more, more efficient and, and work better. That's the hypothesis. It's pretty straightforward. And in every project in our lab, with, particularly with gene editing, there's always an hypothesis made. And this is the type of science that really needs to be done, and it's called hypothesis-driven research. Make a hypothesis, and you spend the rest of your life trying to disprove it. Uh, just for no other reason, I stuck in, and in case you guys have not seen what a real gene looks like, this is the sequence of part of the NRF2 gene, and these are all the little types of proteins that are made from it. So huge challenge, undoubtedly. And uh, this gene is quite long. You're only looking at that spot right there. Here's the whole gene, and you're looking at the sequence right there. So complicated gene and big. Now, <clears throat> someone asked about, um, at me up here, asked me about how long does the, does the gene stay in there? I was going to try to turn these lights off, but I don't know if anyone is uh, back there anymore. Uh, if not, so let me tell you what we're doing here. So uh, Kelly Benas, who's a graduate student in the lab from the University of Delaware, was asking a very simple question. If we introduce CRISPR into a lung tumor cell, how long does it take to get in and how long does it stay inside the cell? Seems like a pretty stupid question. <laughs> But it's the FDA has asked to see this information because they want to know what they're kind of dealing with. So is that possible just for a couple of minutes or a minute? Oh, here. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So what Kelly did was she, th this is, remember, the design of the CRISPR, but she put a fluorescent tag a piece of green fluorescence on the protein, and she put a red tag, it was not a long Christmas, but this actually works this way, on the RNA, the little gold man. Instead of gold, it's red. And then she introduced it into the cell, and she took time points, staying up most of the night, uh, all the way through, and, and looked at uh, these lung cancer cells and where CRISPR is inside the cell. And here's what she found. So if you just look over here, the green is the protein, and the RNA is the, is the red. So within an hour, the protein sits on the outside of the nucleus. Blue is the nucleus, is a nuclear staining. And you can see that the CRISPR RNA is in. Then something is like the dark side of the moon here. <laughs> the green and the red seem to be in the nucleus together. And then at eight hours, things start to be moving out, and by 12 hours, CRISPR has done its job, and it's moved completely out of the cell, and at 24 and 48 hours, it's exiting. So we now believe that gene editing takes place in a cancer cell between one and four hours, and then what we didn't know is that the, the CRISPR and the Cas9 do not dissolve. They come out of the nucleus and head off into the cell somewhere. This is the cytoplasm of the cell, and here's the nucleus. So. Very cool data. This is a second year graduate student named Kelly Benas, and uh, the pictures are very, very exciting. So we have an answer to how long CRISPR is actually working. Okay. I'm, I'm afraid you'll fall asleep, so I'm going to have to put these back on. Good, or is that too much? Oops. There we go. <coughs> so, Here's a picture of what the protein looks like. So proteins are made up of different domains. They're just kind of, you know, some bind, some disrupt. So this is a domain that Kelly knocked out. It's called the nuclear entry signal inside the protein that controls chemoresistance. So she knocked that gene out. And then she looked at, again, the nucleus. So here's what happens in normal cells. Everything is, the, the NRF2 is in the gene. When we knock it out, the gene stays outside. In this case, you're looking at red to represent the protein, the NRF2 protein. So again, another question from the FDA was, show us that the, the CRISPR actually changes the function of the protein. And this is how we do it. You can see it on the outside here. Here it's blended in here. Okay. 
So again, these are the kind of experiments that are ongoing to kind of convince, uh, convince you that we understand how CRISPR is working in a tumor cell. Uh, this is a nude mouse. Uh, it's nude for obvious reasons. It actually doesn't have an immune system. So what we did here was ask whether CRISPR could attack um, lung cancer cells. So the lung cancer cells, human lung cancer cells, are injected into the back of the mouse, and then CRISPR is introduced into the tail vein. Um, it's hanging right here. The tail vein, CRISPR is in here. And the CRISPR is so designed to only knock out the tumor in that particular uh, location inside the mouse. This is called the xenograft model. I didn't bring much data. This is the only slide. This is how fast a tumor grows. It, at minus 13 days up to 14 days. So this is the growth of a, a tumor uh, in about three to four weeks, 600% volume in your lung in, in a month. That's why when people walk in the door, they're at stage three. The tumor grows very quickly. If we knock the NRF2 gene out, we arrest the growth pretty well. But if we then treat with chemotherapy plus the knockout, we've completely arrested tumor growth for two weeks. So this is very exciting. People are, are really excited about it. But it's only two weeks in mice. There, you might be wondering, why didn't we let this go further? Uh, the animal regulations of treating mice, we have to stop the, um, stop the experiment when the tumor gets to this side. This is a pretty big tumor in the back of that mouse. So evidence looks pretty good. I think we have a good opportunity here, and, and the data is starting to look forward. So these are the two people that have joined um, us. Uh, Vien Lai is a uh, FDA expert. He's the one that will argue the case for us with the FDA. And Lauren Sabinsky is actually uh, a, a global regulatory writer. She's extremely good and has worked on some very impressive uh, portfolios. Why are they here? They're here because we don't know how to do this anymore. We have brought the, the technology to a point where now regul regulatory affairs start to kick in. And so these guys come in and they help write the clinical protocol and develop something known as a briefing package for the FDA. We also have a project in melanoma. Um, in this case, it's a little bit easier in the sense that we're reorganizing and re-engineering T cells from a patient. So if you have a, a tumor, a skin tumor, and it's extracted, you can take the tumor out and drop it on a plate, and the T cells come scrambling out. Just remove the tumor, and you've got all the T cells that were in there fighting the tumor. The problem is that the tumor tells your, your T cells, your uh, immune cells, to stop killing itself. And so we've re-engineered the T cells to ignore that signal and continue to fight against the tumor. That's the, that's the project in melanoma. As I mentioned, in sickle cell disease, it's a little bit different. Um, people who have sickle cell disease, the idea is that you want to change a single base. People who have sickle cell disease have that letter or that base in this word, the beta globin word, or the beta globin gene. I hope everyone in this room has an A at that position. People have a single T change. So Brett Sansbury, who is a uh, third-year student in the lab. She's gone on to do something else, but when she was a first-year student, she actually converted, uh, made this change pretty readily. The problem that Brett found with this was that in every single patient, we had a different degree of change. This is the percent change that has happened in patients. Here's a female African-American, only 1%. So only 1% of her stem cells were changed. An another patient, didn't work. A Caucasian male, 33 years old, no smoking, had some activity, higher activity. Interestingly, the 35-year-old male Caucasian who smoked had the best level of gene editing. I know what you're thinking. Somehow with me, it's lung cancer and sickle cell are connected. So if you want to get a good treatment, you have to smoke a pack of Marlboros before you come into the clinic. That'll make Petrelli very happy, I can tell you. So the point about all of this, and it's pretty self-evident, these are all different patient samples. Here's two of the same patient that's been done. And in, in, in this case, it was done one week and then another week with these samples. And we get answers all over the place. Okay. So this addresses one of the bigger problems that we're facing. CRISPR works very efficiently 
The problem is it works very efficiently, differently in different patients. And until we have a capture of that, fixing genetic diseases is going to be a big challenge. With the lung cancer stuff, we're disabling a gene and destroying it. That's, that's pretty straightforward. That's what CRISPR does normally. We don't see that much variance. But fixing a gene is much harder. And the reason for this is you are all different, as we talked about earlier. This in the first part, I talked about genetic diversity. We talk a lot about genetic diversity in patients and how we want to treat individual patients. But this is where it counts the most. Because while we'd like to treat all African Americans with sickle cell disease or Caucasians with cystic fibrosis, the variance that we're seeing among patients is quite dramatic. This is an amazing outcome. The fact that you can fix this gene in people is one thing, but we can't rely on the effectiveness per patient, and that's a big problem. Um, the other mission that I wanted to just point out is that we have uh, transferred this uh, gene editing curriculum to community college students. Uh, this is Kristen Pisarczyk, who uh, works in our lab. She's a, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, and she's working with community college students across the street. And not too long ago, Dr. Janice Nevin, who's our CEO, visited, and she tried to break into this group. I'm not sure they let her in there. But she, uh, she's actually been very, very supportive of this. This is going on, as I said, across the street and will be launched nationally. So that would be very cool. Uh, we're also partnering with the Franklin Institute. I've done a couple of community forums up there. Uh, pretty packed houses on this topic, as you might imagine, with very varying degrees of interest uh, and opinions. And so the Franklin Institute is launching a program called Editing Our Evolution. And so check their websites. It's a great place. There'll be a lot of different speakers, a lot of different topics. And, uh, and they're kind of talking about this openly. And this is more on the should we do this, how should we do this, and about the genetic diversity uh, that we brought to the table. And as I mentioned, we've had a whole series of discussions. And uh, if you follow the, the Christiana website, uh, we're going to do this again. Uh, here's Deb Matthews down here. She looks really smart. You know, I always tell her she looks, uh, she looks smart there. And I'm, as my wife said, you're not on fresh air, so, okay. You know, um, but essentially, this is a topic that we'll, we're going to have a group of people come in uh, to talk about it. Somebody asked also, you had some really good questions, and one of the questions was who's going to pay for this. So this is Ed Pazella. Ed Pazella used to be the vice president uh, and vice chief executive officer of Aetna, and he retired. And I asked, and I heard him talk in Washington, so I invited him to come up. And uh, I said, Ed, you look like you're about 45 years old. He said, I'm 47. And I said, well, why would you need Aetna? He said, well, I left Aetna because I could get more money consulting to Aetna than being a CEO with less pain. So <laughs> at, least, at least he's truthful, okay? Ed and Deb were fascinating. They talked a lot about how insurance companies look at these kind of innovative therapies. Pazella is the guy who is developing the program for Aetna to cover CAR T cells. And he's a very engaging, warm, great speaker, very, very fascinating. Uh, Bob Oakes, who is a lawyer, talked about the intellectual properties um, issues and patents that surround CRISPR. We are not able to use CRISPR freely. Which mean, because we, while we own several patents on CRISPR, we don't own what's called the, the uh, master family. That's owned by Master Institute of Technology and by California Berkeley. We have to license that technology in a Christiana, and we have done that. The wars among who owns parts of CRISPR are, are extraordinary, and they're, they're very, very expensive. So these topics, it's about half a day, it's about three or four hours, but I can't encourage you enough if you're interested in this topic, to, to keep this will be happening in the fall, and uh, and I learned so much there. I'll probably just be the moderator this year and get out of the way, and let these other people talk. It was really enjoyable. Uh, we're actually going to be reunited to some degree at Bio 2019. Um, Bio 2000 is about a 20,000 person um, uh, meeting at the uh, Philadelphia Convention Center, and <clears throat> I put this slide in here for you to read the title only. Uh, you know these criminals in here. <laughs> but can genome editing fulfill? That's what people are interested in. 
They're not necessarily interested in the science is cool and interesting, but will it actually fulfill the promise? This should be a very lively show. Um, Gregorio here, Giorgio, is actually a very, very interesting guy. Uh, the kind of people that deal with CRISPR, so he's the guy who's gone into the Congo and isolated blood samples from various uh, folks and has shown incredible genetic diversity. He's a welcome uh, trust scholar, and he's at University of Pennsylvania. He's a fascinating uh, background, so this should be great. And Jonathan Marone from Harvard has written extensively on a big problem in science. Most uh, medical breakthroughs never reach minority communities, and he's been, <coughs> excuse me, the leading light on that, and uh, it's, so it should be fun to, to listen to them. Now, here I am standing nicely with our FDA review of Sanja. Now, uh, this is probably the last time that she'll be smiling because I'm going to we'll be introducing things and arguing with her for a long time. Uh, she's very good, and she has, she's very receptive. She's very soft-spoken, but very, uh, very much in touch with things. So this is how we're progressing the lung cancer stuff through to her. But I have to tell you that on almost every meeting we have, and the FDA is very open with this. You can, as long as you have a legitimate trial coming forward, they're happy to talk to you. They, this is kind of how they are. Take a look at this sign. No parking anytime, turn off engines. <laughs> so this kind of represents where we are with this at the rate. We, we, we got one hand saying one thing and the other saying the other thing. And the FDA is actually asking uh, investigators what to do. Nobody knows what to do. They just know this is going to be really good, <laughs> but we don't know what's going to happen. So uh, this is from a, a sidewalk at uh, University of Minnesota uh, Parkland. That, that was great. It just uh, made, well, it's probably appropriate it's on a university campus too, right? And again, um, some of the dangers we have here, as we mentioned before, if things go wrong, uh, things can really happen. Uh, Ken Silverstein gave me this slide. Ken Silverstein is the Chief Medical Officer at Christiana Care. This is a series of portraits, self-portraits by Picasso when he was 18, 25, and 90 years old. And this is how he saw himself. We started off in 2012 pretty clean. Uh, we're a little jagged now, especially with the patient diversity, and we're hoping that we just don't end up uh, looking like this in the field. But uh, it's an unusual field. Normally this gets cleaned up, but because of the big implications of CRISPR, it has a chance to, uh, to go south. Uh, these are the people in the lab uh, who do all the work, and I, I get a chance to talk here, current lab members. Um, and I said we've been funded very well by the uh, National Institutes of Health for, for some time. Um, and here they are all. This is... Um, uh, let's see who that is. So Pavel Bilk is here. So he's in his normal clothes now. Probably rented that shirt. Um, <laughs> this is Kelly Benas. I talked a lot about her work here. Uh, she is a major rising star in this area. Uh, Brett Sansbury is kind of her mentor. Brett's about a year ahead, but Brett is uh, also an incredibly talented uh, person. And here's Kristen Pisarczyk. And this guy over here with the odd look on his face is Kevin Blau. And he's actually the guy that's heading up the melanoma group. And here I am worrying about how to pay for all of them. So anyway, I'm happy to take questions. But thank you again for paying uh, attention.